Welcome to Fragmented, a software developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better developers. My name's Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Kaushik, welcome back to a nice summer day. Indeed. It's getting a little uh, toasty, you know. It's, it's time to stop wearing those jackets and sweatshirts and, you know, get on the summer attire. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm welcoming it though. I'm over on the East coast, which is actually where our guest, I, I believe our guest is from too. And I'll tell you what, I, it seems like every year the winter gets longer and longer and longer. And it was almost all the way until June. I was in almost 30 degree weather. And so I'm really enjoying going outside without a sweatshirt right now. So anyway, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we've kicked things back off. I'm super excited about today's episode. Yes, definitely. So this is uh, a very exciting topic for many different reasons. Simply, and I'm not, I don't want to kind of give it all away, so we'll let our guests do that. But who are we talking to today, Kaushik? This is a good friend that we have run across and we have been wanting to have on the episode for quite some time. What makes it that much more exciting is actually this person actively works on a library that both of us have been super curious about. Mm -hmm. And we have... and. Interestingly, like uh, I, I have heard from a lot of listeners and, you know, just like in general, the Android dev community that this is a library that everyone's been wanting to find out more about. Uh, and I think we have the perfect person to help us with that. Definitely, definitely. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome, and like as you said, we've had, a, kind of, we've had a challenging time kind of working out schedules. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome J-Rod to the show. Welcome to the show, J-Rod. Hey, how's it going, everyone? It went pretty good. You know, we're finally, like I said, we're excited to get you on the show. We're finally here and we've been able to catch you. We've won, been wanting to talk to you about your car's extended warranty, and we're glad that you're finally <laughs> here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, J Rod, for folks that aren't familiar with you, um, though I think a lot of people probably will be, uh, where do you, you know, what is your name? Where do you work? And, you know, how did you get into Android development? Sure. Um, so my name is John Rodriguez. I go by JRod on on social media and at work uh, environments. Uh, I work at Cash App on the Cash App product at Block, formerly known as Square, where I've been there for coming up on uh, seven years. Wow, that's awesome. That's right. They did rename it to Block. Yeah, I forgot yeah, about they that. They did, yeah. Um, and as how I got into <laughs> Android development, I started my career as like a, a backend J two E engineer and. Um, I think as a lot of us did in the heyday, once uh, mobile became the cool thing, dabbled into both iOS and Android, and Android just stuck with me. Very cool, very cool. The J2EE, the spring web development days. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kaushik, did you ever do any J2EE? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I went I went. Did you really? dark side there. Uh, really? I didn't I know that. In a previous company, I actually worked where you know it had a complete Oracle stack. Okay. Uh, and I forget what it was. So Oracle actually had their own version of like J2E. I forget it was Web Forms or some very generic mm -hmm. sounding name. I was deep in, man. Like, you know, I did that. Then I, we moved to Spring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, with the <laughs> I am like one of the only Android that have never touched it. So I don't know. I've probably been blessed by that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's not why I, 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 I definitely would agree with that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> so, J Rod, you've, uh, the reason why you brought me on the show is, you have helped author a pretty cool little library by the name of Paparazzi. Can you tell us what this library is and, you know, where did that need come from to create it? Sure. So where did it come from? Uh, basically, during a hack week, I want to say about three years ago, uh, Jesse Wilson and I um, hacked on this. It, it was an idea he came up with. I think he previously explored it. Um, and said, hey, you know, Android Studio has this really cool capability, which we all know as the layout inspector. And it turns out there's a little module embedded in the IDE uh, that provides that functionality. So maybe we can do something with it and turn it into a tool. Uh, and the need for mm -hmm. that tool, uh, we were currently in one of our uh, many redesigns of Cash App. We have, you know, not only do we have uh, to keep ourselves very up to date with the latest engineering Android technologies, but also our design team is always constantly iterating and evolving. And um, we found that it 
can become challenging to to keep up and 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 not necessarily regress on some of the designs and and we definitely don't want to always like have to apologize to designers when we uh you know um really like just regress on a, a ui element due to some design change and so having the need for something like snapshot testing was a uh, very desirable we had been using other tools at the time but those t- those tools required us to build an apk Mm-hmm. And, and deploy it to an emulator and then configure the environment in such a way that we can then take a snapshot and uh it worked we did those on like the the really happy path important screens but we really kind of wanted to get more coverage and so a library like this being able to do this and then also the the the, the main takeaway from this library is that you could do it on the jvm mm-hmm. r- removing the need to build an apk i think was the, the big selling point so there's a couple of really interesting things you mentioned there right like first is running it in the jvm uh you know and without the need of an apk that's the one that's like almost that was mind blowing to me um but even before we jump in there right it may be worth reiterating some of the challenges cuz snapshot testing as you mentioned is you know a, an excellent way to sort of make sure that you you have some level of regression testing on your ui Uh, and the idea is like you just take pictures and those pictures you match against the golden data as to what you would expect right so that's the concept of snapshot testing but uh, you could technically still do that like you mentioned that you know you wanted to make sure that you uh you know you wouldn't make your designers upset especially as you add more features and like things change around you could theoretically have done that with the existing sort of tools that you had right so it's still possible to spin up emulators it's still possible to write all those tests create the apk but it part of it was the speed too right and even like spinning up emulators if you're trying this across different screen sizes then that adds that many more permutations do you think that's a fair way to summarize that 100% i i would even dig in a little more it's like first of all we had uh tried out emulator based testing and to a certain extent we still do if like the espresso ui test suite but as you mentioned build speeds you you mm-hmm. have to run through the entire android tool chain and crunch resources through apt dexing and and, and all that mm-hmm. and on top of that once you deploy the apk to your device um what screen you want a snapshot of may not necessarily be your launch screen so now you have to kind of find the screen um if it's a screen that's not publicly visible you have to maybe turn a feature flag on um and so there's all these extra considerations that you need um and you know then if you want light mar- light mode and dark mode you're going to know how to go to your settings and toggle that and so just like the permutations you, will you change your accessibility font size so now you can see how it looks in 2x or uh half x there's just so many considerations that the the permutation the combinatorics don't um scale well uh at least manually and um to try to then do that in in something that requires an apk uh usually then you'll have to mess around with uh, dependency injection if you're using dagger maybe you're using uh, something else uh to kind of get your environment into a state to to populate the data uh, if you're hitting against staging then you'll have network flakiness and so there're just so many challenges to doing it uh in the incumbent way. Yeah, that's such a good point. I didn't necessarily think about it, but even getting your screen to a state like tra- like traversal sometimes just to in order to get to a screen like you know you have to potentially launch another one and then land in there to have the right set of data. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair point. I wanted to and this is going to sound really rudimentary to you guys, but I think it's important to just kind of rehash it for there's a lot of beginners that listen to the show. from a beginner standpoint who people who have not ever been exposed to snapshot testing or anything like that what is the for to explain it to them why would they be interested in in screenshot testing what benefit does it or snapshot testing what benefit does it give them at the end of the day so when they they see this tool there's like oh wow this is something i want to learn more about if you could explain it to them in like an elevator what would you say to them Sure. Um so imagine a designer uh gives you a Figma spreadsheet updating so a, a Figma rather design of uh the latest uh designs that they they want to work on in the upcoming feature and uh there's a new design template line heights of fonts what else just if you're working in a scrolling view you want to make sure that the margins and paddings are it just a pixel perfect and also things like form factors like does your view render well on 
a Pixel 5 versus a Pixel 2 or a Samsung device. And there's just so many considerations to play around with. Um, and having just a source of truth that you can validate every time you make a code change without worrying that you're accidentally going to break all the things, I think is uh, the motivating factor for snapshot testing. Okay, so it allows you to know that, hey, if I, like you said, maybe it's p- pixel perfect, and for some whatever reason, I've adjusted the padding somewhere unknowingly or maybe not thinking it's a big deal and all of a sudden it that then maybe i check it in and when these snapshot tests run it kind of compare i guess you know we'll get into the how it works but maybe it compares what we expect versus what came in and says hey these snapshots don't match don't don't match and then we can kind of go investigate why that happened is, is that a correct assumption yeah yeah that's a, a great way to put it I can actually give a very specific example that I ran into where it became so important to have that snapshot test, right? Uh, There was a point like where we built a feature at Instacart, right? And there was like an orientation screen. Mm -hmm. So this is like a screen that tells you, hey, this is what's about to happen. Like, you know, if especially if you're introducing a new feature, we like to sort of add that intro tutorial like screen. What we noticed is there were a certain set of devices if, if, uh, you know, some of our shoppers had a screen font size that's slightly bigger and smaller screen, a part of the orientation would just not be visible, right? It would, it, it would be there, but you have to scroll down and it almost changed the way that that functionality worked, right? Because an important part of the orientation was below the fold, as we used to say in the web days, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, so technically most of our tests, like we didn't anticipate that. So like, you know, your espresso test, you would scroll down, check, all of that would look fine right like so our tests would pass but it's only when you bring up the snapshots and you look at the snapshots because the other advantage with snapshots is it's easy to just visually take a look at it right so when our designers took a look at it they were like wait what like how is this this is like the most important part of that orientation right or even if our product folks look at it that's something where we're like oh this needs to actually be visible and having that snapshot and we want it to be visible in this fashion it's so useful having a snapshot test because then you can just have that matching be precise, right? Versus any manipulation of the screen and then testing. So that's like a very easy example to sort of point out where, you know, having that snapshot tests work. Yeah, and I think it's it's pretty cool that this is, a, um, we, we talked about this already, but a lot of these things that have, there's been that kind of some, I've worked with some snapshot testing before in, in different libraries, but it's always been through one of the challenges that people have not done this is, and J-Rod and, and you covered it, Kaushik, is that you have to a lot of times fire up an emulator and you have to kind of go through the whole crazy long build process and you mm-hmm. know, just to get this one snapshot. And, and paparazzi to me, which was interesting, and in, in just looking right at the right at the uh, webpage, which we'll link in the show notes here, the right after the title of, of it says, an Android library to render your application screens without a physical device or emulator. As soon as I read that la- those last last few words without a physical device or emulator, my eyes perked up, which kind of gets us to the next question, which is, and Kaushik wrote in our notes here, like, what is this black magic? And and how do you, how do you, how does this work? Well, so which parts exactly the, like the paparazzi snapshot comparison, or do you, or is the question more about how does this work about an emulator or device? I think, yeah, it was the emulator piece that we were like, definitely curious about because historically that's like, we're, we have, you either need a real device or an emulator. Right? Yeah. Um, and you hinted uh, a little at it at the start, but I, I am curious. You mentioned that Android Studio has like a jar that you noted that was used for the layout inspector. Can you talk to us about that? I'm also curious more so because, and how this is played in practice, right? Because right. the layout inspector, like how do you get that to render data that you provide, right? Do mm-hmm. you like just, yeah, talk to us about that because I think that's the mind blowing bit. And Sure. Maybe if you can also touch on, so what happens if I just run a unit test? Do you run this, spin it up and then spin it down? Like that's the piece that I'm like, whoa, mind blown. So if you can talk through that. For sure. So the the lib is called layout lib. Um, It's layoutlib.jar. It previously was a pure uh, Java jar, but now it it uses JNI to work on, uh, well, I'll explain that in a bit. But LayoutLib is what it, it contains Android.jar <laughs> entirely, the entire Android platform, but with some creative bytecode hacks. Um, 
The reason for this is there are just some things that Android needs uh, from the device from a native level. Think of like sensor data. Um, so what what Layoutlib essentially does, it takes Android.jar and does some bytecode magic to fake out, intercept method calls that otherwise would have necessarily needed to hit uh, device native code and provides fakes, fake implementations for some of those things. There's one magic class of layout lib called bridge, which is essentially the initializer. And so things like the context, things like layout inflator, mm. those all have to be sort of faked out in order to, for example, on an APK on a device, layout inflator would be inflating binary resources or layouts uh, that were compressed into the APK and, and into yeah, but compressed into the APK. But in Layout Inspector, it will read your layouts from the file system in a pre-crunched world, and so it's it's still parsing layouts XMLs or um, but instead of the binary form, it's a flat file uh, text version. And so it, those are still the entry points, the hooks into the Android platform, but with different implementations. Things like the system services, like the keyboard service or input method manager, uh, et cetera, those also all have to be faked out since um, there will not be a device equivalent in managing some of those things. How did you folks find this? It seems so <laughs> obscure almost. How did you How did you even know this existed? Kudos to Jesse Wilson on that and his uh, digging in the repo. I, I think that his digging there and then just bringing this up as a Hack Week idea is is where I uh, I joined forces awesome and you mentioned layout lib is this something that is a jar that google already has or is this something that you you folks made no no it's a it's a google it, in fact it's on the aosp repo um the sources everything is on there and they publish uh, also the pre-built binaries every version of android studio and the android gradle plugin comes with a a new version of layout lib ah interesting and part of why I was asking that is because I remember uh, when, as you were describing how you know the layout lib functionality exists, historically that was one of the dings against RoboElectric, right? Because RoboElectric is also an extremely popular UI testing. It isn't snapshot testing, so I know there's like some differences there, but they attempted something similar, right? And they would have shadow classes. So for yep. all the things you mentioned, where you needed an Android context, or you at least need like some kind of resource config uh, file. All of those things were sort of uh, re-implemented, so to speak, yep. in the RoboElectric library. Yeah. And to be completely fair, Paparazzi has some cases where it does similar. At the end of the day, because the Android platform that's packaged into Layalib is, I don't know, 95% complete, 90% complete, there are, there are some gaps. Um, one interesting bug uh, that I realized in, in Paparazzi when we were trying to render our cash card graphics, like we work with uh, artists to uh, come out with special renditions of cash card, and one of our, uh, our our vector drawables wasn't rendering appropriately, and it turns out that it was because LayoutLib uh, had not provided uh, the matrix multiplication function. So ma matrix operations on Android result in native calls. And some of those things are faked out by layout lib, but are apparently not multiplication. And so paparazzi, uh, basically, there was code in RoboElectric Shadows that had to do something similar. And you know, it's open source, so we <laughs> we cribbed it and it solved the problem for us. And so there, you know, over time, I guess we could upstream the fix to layout lib and and make that part of the the platform, but. Uh, RoboElectric, uh, I think, maybe took a, a step further instead of maybe using the Android platform tools that are baked into Layalib. I think, and this could just because be because of history and timelines. I, I'm not sure how mature the Layalib uh, versions might have been back when RoboElectric became a thing, but they had to do a lot of hard work to uh, recreate the Android platform environment. I think uh, just because of timelines, Paparazzi got to benefit from a more mature version of Layalib. Yeah, and I could have sworn there was like a PR on RoboElectric at one point where they attempted it. This is some time back, so I don't actually recall, but I remember it was closed for some reason. So yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. And can you tell me a little about how like the underlying tech works in terms of so this lib, oh, actually, I have a two-part question. How does the lib in itself within Android Studio work? So does that mean every time I have my layout inspector up and running on the side, are there PNG or JPEG images that are being rendered like you know, in real time? Or 
you know, and that's what we use? Or was that image generation piece something that you had to add separately? Just, yeah, can you walk us through that? So, yeah, sure. So one of the things that Layout Lib provides is this idea of a, a render session. And so you bridge, as I mentioned earlier, is the initializer. That is what sets up mm. uh, the Android platform and just class loads all the things. Uh, you do have to provide at certain points, like where you have to provide it file paths to certain bits that it needs, like fonts, for example. Mm. But otherwise, the bridge is the initializer, and then you create a render session. Uh, you pass it the view that you want to take a snapshot on, and then it renders a uh, an image that you uh, we then write to the file system. But in the case of uh, Layout Inspector, it, it renders it right there. Um, for those who might be curious and like to source dig on AOSP, there's a class called Render Task. It's just an async job that uh, Android Studio uses to render the layout uh, inspector image. Um, and Paparazzi is essentially uh, just an analog to render task. Um, it's bundled in a JUnit rule uh, for JUnit test purposes, but it, it does that computation. Nice. That is pretty fascinating. I, 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 it's, such an, <laughs> it's such an interesting, cool idea, I must say. So that's the piece that like, really gets me excited. And how exactly do you run these tests? Is this so? Is there a mechanism of us? You run a command, generate the snapshots, use that as your golden data, like you know, to use the snapshot testing terminology. Yeah, how, how does that? Yeah, so so there are three modes. Um, uh, there's the the what's currently called the test mode, but um, we've been going back and forth on maybe we should re re uh, name that to like development mode. Um, the idea the idea is that. Um, Think of like what composable previews bring today to the IDE, but in a legacy view form where if you wanted to iterate on a UI and it's not quite there yet, but you would run the test and you would see a snapshot in real time. And so what, what Paparazzi does in test mode or development mode, if we want to call it that, is it renders an HTML page. Uh, admittedly, it's a little basic right now. We'd like to uh, double down on that in the next uh, iterations and make it better. Um, but it's an image, right? It's a web page right now that will show a series of all the snapshots that you've taken. So every time you run tests, it records a new snapshot. Um, and so you see a time series of the evolution of your page. And it's a quick way to just mm. either check progress or catch regressions while developing. Once you are satisfied, you would then enter the second mode, you would record it. And the, the main difference there is uh, you you were recording in the development phase, but you didn't necessarily think that would be the golden value. You were just it was just a temp a trans uh, a transient stage. Mm. But in record mode, now you're going to save it to a path that you want to persist um, in some source or control. Like probably Git LFS is the most common way. That's what we use. Um, and the reason for LFS is because storing binary objects that can change often in Git um, would probably not scale well over time. So we decided to use Git LFS to, to store the snapshots. But now it becomes part of the repository as a golden value. And then either locally or on CI, you'd run the verify task. And that'll essentially run the same thing, but now do a comparison of actual versus expected, where the expected was the previously recorded snapshot. Nice, nice. And this is just more for my curiosity. For the actual comparison of the images, do you folks write something on your own or did you use like one of the existing libs? I'm just yeah, out of curiosity. We wrote something on our own. Um, it's right now okay. I know that we noticed some differences on a multi-platform. We get these, the, 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 the more interesting cases like the Intel Max versus the M1 Max currently has like a 99.99% accuracy. It, we suspect it's due to anti-aliasing pixels in a class called hardware renderer. But yeah, that's that's something we're digging into at the moment. But that's the idea, is that uh, we will compare a previous snapshot. I ran, before this call, I ran the, the sample app, which outputs the, the HTML file. And it has, I was just looking at it when you were talking, and it's kind of cool because you've run a bunch of different you know, environments to see how each one, each of the screens are going to look. And when you mouse over like the screenshot, it'll tell you like, Hey, I'm looking at one here. It's called pixel three, different themes, light, no action bar. So you can see what it looks like. And then the one next to it is like, this one has an action bar. And then further down, there's like, this is what it looks like uh, when it's in landscape mode. And there's all different types of configurations, which is really cool to actually see how each of these screens renders in all these different environments. Are all these options configurable to say, hey, I only care about these four configurations or I want 
all the permutations or what? Yeah, exactly. So similar to the drop down menu that exists or existed in Android Studio where you could pick your device frame, mm-hmm. we essentially uh, use those same classes to provide like resolution or landscape information. We're also exploring like locale settings and, and other uh, things that might be uh, configurable. But yeah, so what you would do is you'd either explicitly refer to those device configs in your paparazzi rule. Like you'll, you'll create your, your rule for paparazzi. And one of the things you can provide is a device config. I'd highly recommend considering if you're not already uh, using the, the Google test parameter injector, because then you can run a variety of device configs. And so you can, without having to change your test substantially, uh, you can run it over all the pixels or landscape and portrait if you'd like. Mm. So it's a it's a really cool addition to just testing in general. Interesting. Hey, this okay. Got it. test parameter injector. Is that the yeah? That's for Google, right? That's Google's. Yeah, it, um, people may be familiar with uh, Square Burst, which was a thing, but uh, the the test parameter injector uh, is a lot more flexible, and so we're we're really big fans of it. Oh. So that. So you can then provide your configurations that way a little more dynamically then. Yep. You can just run all the combinatorics, ah. whether it's a uh, locale or device oh. config or accessibility size. So you could say, okay, I want to run it across these four devices with these three font sizes. And so you'll get 12 snapshots as a result because four times three, assuming I did my math right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. I, there used to be, uh, I was trying to, I was like, wait, isn't this already built in? But I, when I, thought about it it's like yeah JUnit has this a uh, mechanism of doing this and it's parameter is right like that's what it used to be called oh very nice very nice yep that also that also exists i think uh it's we have used parameterize as well and it, it works perfectly fine i think there was just a little less configuration in, in the tpi version the test parameter injector version but similar purposes and i'm looking for folks that are listening if, if you want to see that in use it looks like you're actually using the the test parameter injector inside of the sample app and the paparazzi library itself. So that's pretty cool to see it and see it in use there. If people are wondering how to use it or if they've never seen it, which I haven't. Yeah. Also, I think Alex Vanyo from Google recently tweeted a, a, a more production mm-hmm. usage of TPI and uh, paparazzi. So um, I could link you the tweet later, but it's it was a really cool example to see in the wild. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You can see that I'm looking at the config right now uh, for the test parameter injector and you have different devices set up and you know you have light themes and no action bars and uh, and all that gets injected that's pretty cool cool awesome thanks for sharing back in episode 52 of fragmented is when we talked about this and yeah oh, we did? I, yeah yeah wow <laughs> and it, it, i've never heard of tpi and i'm looking at this and i'm like oh this looks so much more nicer and cleaner so thank you i did not even know about this i had another quick question that popped up uh Gerard. How does this work with Jetpack Compose? Is, is something different? Like, or, or internally, is Google using the same layout lib infrastructure? Because I know, obviously, Jetpack Compose is like, you know, the rage these days. So if I write my tests now, do I have to change something when I move to Jetpack Compose? Or does it all remain the same? No. So in the recent release of Paparazzi, we added Compose support. Um, now, when you snapshot your Composable, uh, you can, it has a Lambda like method signature so that it, it just feels more natural to just inline your composable in the snapshot method. Under the covers, it wraps it in an Android view and does the, the, the safe state and, and lifecycle owner the wiring that's needed for composables. But otherwise, it uses the same infrastructure and as Layoutlib. And part of that is because choreographer at the end of the day is, is kind of the trick ah. to uh, figuring out like how these, these views are being rendered um, in terms of like frame counts. And in Jetpack Compose, I, I believe I'm, I'm still in beginner mode on Jetpack Compose, but the atomic frame clock uh, that backs uh, how mm-hmm. Jetpack Compose renders frames is, is ultimately uh, implemented using Choreographer. And so Choreographer is still the root of how things get rendered on Android. Mm. And so I think um, just providing that, and, and fun fact is Layout Live actually fakes out Choreographer. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, that that's... Yeah, super cool stuff. I did have a question, and I don't even know if this is even related at all. So if it's if it's not, you know, we can disregard. But years ago, I used another snapshot testing tool from Facebook called Facebook Snapshot Testing. How does this compare to that, or does it not, or is it in a different ballpark, or what? So this is what we were using before, and uh, it was it was a really 
it's a great tool. I think just the necessity to have an APK on device um, and all the uh, the emulators and the build speeds and all that was what ultimately decided led us to to kind of use a different implementation or kind of even work on paparazzi. But otherwise, yeah, that was the co- incumbent tool at the time that we were using, and it works great. Yeah, especially when you move into this world where like most people are with the whole unidirectional MBI like world. It just makes this so much more compelling having something like paparazzi, right? Because you can just dump your view state and say, okay, just here's the view state, test all kinds of configurations, right? And that makes it pretty compelling. I, I, I was th- And we, we also have another uh, feature coming soon. It's technically available now, but it's I wouldn't call it supported. Um, mm-hmm. But we have a, a video mode where you can... So right now, if you take a snapshot, um, you may encounter subtle bugs if... For example, you miss a frame, like everything has to be drawn in the first frame or mm. paparazzi will not catch it at the moment. This can cause some some problems if, for example, you're using do on next layout, uh, where you first need to get the size of a parent view group or in a composed world, if you need to recompose before you can finally render a sub view or sub composable. And so there, we've kind of gone back and forth on do we maybe provide hooks into paparazzi to to in certain cases jump to a second frame. But I think ultimately what we've decided is that would be a good case to use the same thing that you would use for an animation snapshot test, uh, where you just record a video and persist that. And uh, I know we've started to use it internally, but we want to like clean up a few things before we make it uh, a public supported API. Would you be able to compare? I mean, can you compare videos or is that something that has to be more manual? So literally that's one of the things under consideration. We spiked out something where we would do of yes, frame by frame diffing and maybe have like a cool like uh think of like when you record a video on your iPhone and you scrub through the frames and you like maybe even can crop out sort of things. It'd be nice to kind of see play around with the animation after the fact, but uh that's still a work in progress. Okay. Is there um I know when I used to run a lot of these snapshot tests at a, at a previous client, we ran into a lot of false positives. Is there a way to, and I think you'd said before, there's like a, like a 99% like barrier that you would hit in certain like aliasing or something like that. Is there a way to kind of set a threshold saying, Hey, if this matches this percentage, or is that even, I don't even know if that's even possible. Yeah. That's one of the configuration options in paparazzi right now. Uh, it's max percent difference. And I believe internally we've been setting that to 0.01. Yeah. It works. It works. I will admit, though, you may sometimes some things may fall through the cracks as a result. Like if you have a really small icon difference, Mm -hmm. then it would not detect that if you do not ask for the 100 percent pixel perfect comparison. Uh, That's also something we're looking into. Uh, Maybe considering how to ignore anti-aliasing effects would be the approach we take there. Okay. You mentioned about like I I, I was curious because I think you mentioned one of the advantages over using something like Facebook snapshot testing library before was, you know, just the build times. How does that work in reality? Like, have you found that your build times, I, I imagine just spinning up the emulator, you shave a massive amount just there, but in general, do these tests run fast? You, you know, what have you observed like uh, in practice? So tests were running, I think on a two to four second cadence, which if you have thousands of them, it's still very slow. Mm-hmm. And in, in the most recent release, we shaved that significantly down to, I, I don't have exact numbers, but I know that uh, from anecdotal data, one of our CI shards went from around, I want to say 25 minutes to, I think, eight. Oh, wow. Okay, that's good. Yeah. And, and so and so the reason for that is because JUnit rules, they're instantiated before every test method. And a, the paparazzi was previously loading the entire Android platform and loading the resources on the file system and doing some what we call method interceptors. Those are the analog to roboelectric shadows, again, to kind of yeah. fill, the, f- fill the gap in some areas. Um, so it was doing all of that, taking your snapshot and destroying it only to then go on to the next test. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so it was a very heavy loading process. So uh, we statically cache it now, and that's what accounts for the big drop off in runtime. Got it. That makes like a lot of sense. Along those lines, like what are like some of the other cons that you can think of, right? Like, you know, what is there a time you would not suggest anyone use paparazzi, or are there things that they should be a little extra cautious about in terms of like, you know, 
how like for example you mentioned small icons yeah okay that's a good reason to keep in mind what are some other things that you think we should keep a closer eye on sure so one of the things that i uh, i've noticed is a, a lot of bugs on, in paparazzi uh and this is not to throw any shade on google it's it's they they are inherited from layout lib um it's actually a great opportunity to allow us to maybe contribute to the repo as well and try to you know be more collaborative on this which is something we're intending to do um but up until now we've been kind of working around it with uh, the method interceptors and so it's just it's it's a hundred it's a hundred percent accurate to the extent that layout inspector is accurate mm. there have been times that uh for example um before layout lib went to use um the the native skia graphics pipeline that actually works on device mm-hmm. and so what what do i mean by that so before layout lib went native it was essentially recreating the graphics pipeline using java awt toolkit stuff and it turn and it de- it turns out that things like font metrics were jdk specific and so like your mm. your font your font metrics for ascenders and descenders on JDK 8 Oracle versus JDK 11 Adopt Open JDK would possibly result in different font renderings um, because of the AWT limitations. That's gone away now that uh, Google's decided to uh, do away with that in Layout Lib and instead run the same graphics pipeline that Android uh, devices use. And that's what sort of accounted for some of that slowness. But uh, so it's gotten better. But it's still because of the nature that it's still faking out Android mm. is still prone to some bugs. So loading on a device is like a hundred percent accurate. We're ninety nine point nine 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 and trying to get as close to a hundred mm. as possible. But that does involve um, improving layout live as things evolve. Is there a concern that? you work on this and you're like because you mentioned one of the positives is you can con- contribute back possibly based on the bugs you observe to layout lib and as more of the community works on this i imagine google would be thrilled right like because this is almost like free <laughs> bug reporting and improvements but you know just to play devil's advocate is there a concern that google might come swap this whole thing out and say just kidding we're changing something have you, have you guys thought about it not that i know that there's too much you can do about it but i'm just curious if you thought through that no concern. Um, if, if for example, they implemented a paparazzi feature native to Android Studio, I think the community would really accept that and enjoy that. It would definitely alleviate <laughs> some of the, the the work that we've been doing. Um, but I don't think there's a concern at the moment. In fact, at the moment, there are several Google Teams that are, are using or exploring the use of paparazzi internally, which I find which which I which I really enjoy. I know we have Android X and um, and Google Wear team interested in, in using paparazzi for some of their testing so uh, that's exciting yeah no that sounds great I, I should have rephrased my question do you think that well i guess the answer is no because they use it in android studio which is one of the advantages over something like robo electric right like my question is mm-hmm. do you think you know they might move away from layout lib or they might replace it with something else and that leaves it sort of uh but i guess i kind of answered my own question given that it's used yeah yeah, I, maybe I, I doubt it though, because especially now with composable previews being such a, a huge value add, um, that's from my understanding. Poking around the sources, it's built on top of that. It still works with Layout Lib. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've actually been digging recently into how preview elements are parsed and then passed down to Layout Lib under the covers. So there's there'd be a lot of what would it be replaced with uncertain so i think it has some legs on it no that makes perfect sense and especially that's why i was i was asking it jetpack compose right like it seems it's in the same direction which means you know you're not going to like see another change at least in our ui stack for some time so <laughs> if we did talk about some of the challenges and limitations is but is there anything that paparazzi can't do if i'm approaching this as someone who just wants to start using it that maybe that i should be aware of yeah, so I mean, other than the the limitations of layout lib under the covers, um, it wouldn't do like screen navigations. It we've talked about whether something like that could be done in the future. It would impose a bit of an architectural uh, change, both not only in in the library itself, but also how one architects their own apps. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so if you really do care about the uh, transitions between screens, that currently uh, is not handled. And again, if something that really is device specific that you could only get from running on a device, like we we tend to fake a lot of those things out, and we have a very opinionated architecture on Cash App, mm-hmm. so those 
tend to be abstracted away. Mm. Um, but if if you happen to currently work in an app where there is a lot more coupling, it may be challenging. Um, for example, we've recently been working on an internal project that decouples uh, views and presenters, um, and it's just it's really made our views as uh, as simple as possible. It's just pass it a view model, uh, not like an Android view model, but like a model that describes all the metadata that a view would need and just call setters and getters. And the your view should not have any references to business logic at all. It really should only have references to Android X or Android or you know, custom view logic. And if if one can strive to reach that architecture, uh, paparazzi becomes a lot more of a value add. Um, I know, for example, we've had to do some workarounds with like inflation injection, uh, it, we we had because not all of our views have necessarily migrated to this new architecture. Can you still use paparazzi in a view that uses inflation injection? Sure, you can, um, but you'll have to recreate that inflation injection dagger graph now in your test. It's not insur- it's not insurmountable, but it's how much how much more test setup now do you want to work on in order to accomplish that? I like to think that adopting something like paparazzi forces you into a cleaner architecture. So it's a win-win. No, that makes perfect sense. And a quick follow-up. The other thing obviously is like, and this might way we might have to wait until like, you know, the direction for video is set, but I guess animations, if you want to test animations, that is also obviously something that isn't necessarily supported, right? Like there isn't like a okay, freeze frame at this point of the animation and then test. Uh, so there is a way right now to provide offsets um, in the, well, I think that's in the video method, actually. So not in the current snapshot method. Uh, that would be actually an interesting use case if, if we just provided an offset to the snapshot method. And then it still only takes one frame, but it, but only the a, a frame that's not at time zero is essentially what you're suggesting. Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, yeah, I'd be open to it if someone wants to send a PR to that. I think the video would be more compelling because it would, otherwise, I don't know if the context of, you know, a five second into the animation frame shot, like, yeah, it, yeah. 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 How, yeah how valuable is that? Like, I, you're right. I think the video aspect seems more mm-hmm. compelling in many ways. I'm loving what I'm hearing so far. Uh, this is amazing. <laughs> I, I want to use this. Um stat on one of my projects right now i I think i'm probably going to be implementing it this week so thank you for putting this this library together it's amazing i'm still amazed that there's no need for an emulator i'm so used to after what 2022 over 12 years (laughs) of android development i'm so used to needing an emulator for this kind of stuff so to finally have it to where i don't need it uh that's just it's mind blowing. So it's amazing. We've been finding it, we've been finding it really helpful uh, in our migration from legacy views to compose. If we have existing, yeah, because now um, because paparazzi supports both, mm-hmm. oh. um, you can take a, you can take a lot more liberty in terms of like as we're all learning composables and you know figuring out how to use remember <laughs> immutable state of properly. Uh, we can at least migrate and see. Oh, okay, I clearly messed this up. I didn't add the right modifier. And the snapshots will tell you. And then to a certain extent, if things are like a pixel off just because like constraint layout and legacy view versus how Compose renders its hierarchy, then it's a judgment call. If it's like aligned one pixel up and you're like, that's good enough, then just re-record a new snapshot and that's fine. But it, it just enables you to make that decision without worrying about regressing too far. Great tool to help you in that transition. That's am- I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I've when you mentioned the compose, I was thinking, oh, this is great because now you can just, you know, you don't even have to worry about, you know, running actual like QA cycles. You know, you can at least with eighty to ninety percent confidence, you can just run the whole suite of things. And if the snapshots look the same, then great, ship that compose <laughs> sort of framework. So to Don's question, he wants to start uh, adding this on a side project this week. Where, where does one start? Can you like point us like, you know, if I want to go in and add it to my app at Instacart, w- w- what would the steps be? Like, you know, where, how would you suggest someone walk through that process? Sure. So it's it's a few lines. Um, there's samples, um, which we should probably create a few more. Um, but on the readme, um, it'll explain that you add it to your Gradle configuration, assuming you use Gradle, um, and then apply. There's a Gradle plugin that you apply the plugin. Um, under the covers, it'll also add uh, the paparazzi uh, module to your test dependencies. So that's what kind of, I mean, the the plugin does some other things, but one of the things that it does is also adds that. It'll download 
all the layout lib stuff from Maven Central. You write a test, a few lines of code, and boom, it sh- that should be it. That sounds fantastic. Almost oh, sounds too easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, we've, we've thought hard about it, like how to make this work and make it as simple as possible. And um, we've had um, some feedback from uh, like Chris Baines from Twitter, for example, said, yeah, it, it was pretty straightforward. It was pleasantly surprised. So that was very exciting to hear. We designed the plug. We so we're we're Gradle users, and so we have a Gradle plugin. Mm-hmm. We have designed the JUnit rule to allow for other plugins. For example, if you use Bazel, mm-hmm. uh, we're we're not we're not in developing a Bazel plugin in, internally because we are we're currently Gradle consumers on the Android side. Mm-hmm. But if someone wanted to provide and maintain a Bazel plugin, um, that would be interesting. Um, really, the Gradle plugin, besides doing all the Gradle task uh, wiring is it spits out a resources file. If you remember RoboElectric, how there was a RoboElectric oh, yeah. properties file, mm-hmm. it's kind of it's kind of similar to that, but instead of you having to manage that properties file yourself, the Gradle plugin like just it, you know reads the environment information and spits out this test this file that then bootstraps the actual JUnit rule. So it's conceivably someone could write a, a Bazel plugin that just spits out that same text file and it would quote unquote just work. Very cool. Yeah, so please try it out. It should be a very quick addition. Oh, we will. <laughs> Definitely. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. So if folks want to reach out to you and maybe follow up with any questions that they have, what's a good way to do it, Dan? Yeah, sure. So uh, you can tweet me at uh, J-R-O-D-B-X, J-R-O-D-B-X, or you could, uh, if you, for questions. And if you have any issues, uh, we have the Paparazzi GitHub repo where we have uh, issues and discussions enabled. Thank you so much. And Don, once folks, uh, once you have your side project up and going on Paparazzi and people want to reach out to you to see how your experience was, what's a good way to reach out to you? They can find me on Twitter or Instagram under the same handle, which is just at Don Felker. Same for you, Kaushik. How do folks get a hold of you to ask about your process in implementing it? I am Kaushik Gopal on Twitter and Instagram and all uh, the other places. John, Thank you so much for chatting with us. Before we wind it down, do you want to like give us like, you know, what is your vision for this project? How, where do you see it going? And you can like, you know, wind it down with that. Yeah, sure. So one of the thoughts that we've been thinking over lately is this works great as a J unit rule. What else can we apply it to? And so we've been thinking as like, now that we've released 1.0 and we're then out constantly supporting the issues that come in, but if we can extract the core of paparazzi and make it into a rendering utility for other purposes. One vision that we've had internally is uh, we have a lot of server-driven UI flows, which I think the community is going to be hearing a lot more about that we've been working over the last year on Cash App to to be doing. Uh, We have a a couple of internal tools that we want to open source. But the tail DR on that is that server engineers constantly want to test out Android flows. Mm -hmm. And it can be a bit cumbersome for someone who's mostly doing server work all day to then learn how to onboard as an Android dev for the sole purpose of checking the one screen. It's like basically the the reasoning why snapshot testing on the JVM was better than physical device. Now add the additional step of getting your environment set up for Android as someone who's not an Android engineer mm-hmm. by trade can be a very huge uh, hurdle or barrier. And, and we do it today. So what if we can provide like a desktop app, let's say a Jetpack Compose desktop app that renders a paparazzi screenshot based on some configuration, maybe drag and drop a, a protocol protocol definition, protocol buffer definition. Um, those are some ideas we're kicking around. We could probably we could probably do some more with the project. So definitely, if you have ideas, again, please reach out to me. I'd love to to chat. But uh, yeah, basically taking it from a JUnit rule and extending the the powers of layout lib, I think, would be a great uh, future project. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us, John. We really appreciate it. This is like a wealth of information and you know, Thank you. it's got us pumped up. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening. And thanks again. We will catch you all in the next episode. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening.